This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're diving into the world of the State Liquor Authority, whose responsibilities include doling out licenses and permits and taking action against entities that violate the state's alcohol laws and rules. We are joined in the studio by Lily Fan, who has served as the chair of the State Liquor Authority since the summer of 2023 and has been a member of the three-person panel since 2018 and, most importantly, won a Tony Award for co-producing Town. Welcome to the show, Chair Fan. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm good. So, for starters, how did you end up getting appointed by now former Governor Cuomo to be a commissioner on the State Liquor Authority? And, and what made you take on the responsibility at the time? Was it something you dreamed about as a young girl? It's certainly not something anyone really dreamed about to become an alcohol regulator. Um, I got identified because I was a member on the community board. I okay. was secretary of Manhattan Community Board 4 proudly serve on that board. And um, at the time, I was um, offered the opportunity to submit my name. I was just starting to have children. And I thought it would actually make sense to do my public service hours during the daytime instead of being a nighttime volunteer on a community board. And serving as a commissioner is a per diem job as opposed to what you have now, this full-time chair position. So what did you have to give up to take on this new role as chair and make this big transition with your life? Thank you for asking that. There is actually, you know, huge sacrifices. I have put my production career, my storytelling um, endeavors on pause right now. Your Tony award-winning career. <laughs> Suppose so. I very luckily still have a show that is on Broadway that is ongoing and just started running very successful in London. So that's ongoing. But what I've really given up is a lot of parenting time with my children because I've been going back and forth between New York City and Albany a lot. So that's been a challenge, and you know, as a family, we're continuing to try to work on that. How do you make the calculation as a young parent about that work-life balance? Because I know I grew up in a household with two parents, both who worked, including my mom was the managing editor of our local newspaper, was picking us up at six, making dinner, and then actually putting the paper to bed later in the evening. So what is that schedule like for you? You have to plan ahead. I do a lot of logistics planning when I'm on the train. You know, I have, you know, a lot of support at home. I try to put them in after curricular activities, but, you know, spend quality time with them. In a way, I've actually had better parenting experience because of how busy my job is, because now I really do value it. You know, the weekends, we do try to do actual activities, um, you know, my kids are eight and six and starting to really, you know, focus on the academics and help them, you know, learn and, um, you know, and have real conversations. I think also the fact that I am now working in a full-time public service role actually, you know, does mean something for my two kids. And that's why I'm continuing to uh, serve in this administration. Do they understand the scope of the work you do or how important it is or just that you seem stressed sometimes? I think they understand that I am the first woman and the first non-white person to run this agency. I think they understand that I'm in a job that is not easy to come by now. I think they understand that. And those two distinctions you mentioned, is that important to you personally? I think that it's important to me not from like, oh, I'm making history standpoint because I never lived to be the first of anything. I'm an immigrant. I come from a place where it was all Chinese people. So being Chinese wasn't a special thing as when I was growing up, right? So when you're a real immigrant, I kind of saw Chinese people running systems. So that's not something that's like so surprising right. to me as a person. Um, however, I do think that this administration is making a clear effort to bring the diversity to the table. You know, I think a lot of people that are at the cabinet meetings never would dream that we would run an agency um, when we were young. I think that is an intended effort by this administration. And I think the, the creativity and just a different perspective, um, I hope to bring that to the table and actually do something different at this agency. I mean, besides being a non, the first non-white and first woman, I'm also one of the first people that didn't come from a law enforcement background. I didn't, I did, was not a prosecutor. And that, I think, make it that I have more flexibility in the way I view this job. Well, yeah, let's stick with your approach to this job. And I'm curious, 
how, if at all, you've made a conscious effort to take this work on differently than your predecessor, who, let's say, had a, a mixed reviews from stakeholders uh, in the alcohol industry. Did you consciously try to deviate from his example? Were there things that you tried to continue that Vince uh, Bradley did? How did you think about your administration? I think my administration really is a continuation of his, mm -hmm. to be honest. I think that there were already changes in the budgetary um, you know, conversations with the chamber that was happening when he was still in the role. Perhaps what I bring to it is maybe more of a willingness for change. And alcohol, it's a very difficult er area. It's archaic. It's complicated. Very few people actually want to spend the time to learn it. And so I really value our legislative partners that actually know this stuff and want to work on it together to make it easier for all our licensees. So I also come from a legislative background, so I have sort of more appetite for for change and legislative conversations. Yeah, working in the state Senate, how do you think that impacted your view of government or maybe the responsibility of state agencies more specifically? Oh, everything. I um, was very fortunate. I was a staffer. I was the first uh, committee counsel for the Senate Committee on Social Services. Mm -hmm. I learned from you know one of the best senator squadron who was a creative guy. He was a smart guy, and he was always questioning, always pushing the envelope, and that's how I learned it. It's, you know, you have to ask the questions. You have to get creative. He was probably one of the most creative legislators that I have never met. That experience is everything. I still have a lot of relationships now um, on in both houses mm -hmm. because of my work during that time. A lot of my friends that were staffer then are now members. You know, that makes a difference. Uh, people know me because of my work in uh, the short time as social services counsel. So I think there's inherent trust um, that exists. I don't think it's that easy to come in to change alcohol law, but because I have a social services background, I think there is an understanding of what my baseline is and why I'm doing this. And, you know, that is very helpful. Well, sticking with that idea of learning, what have you learned about the working of the State Liquor Authority as chair and being full-time involved that someone who's a commissioner, like the experience you had, might not be cognizant of? Was this a big illuminating experience in 2023 when you took on this new job, or did you have a sense of what you were getting into as a commissioner? That's a good question. I think when you sit on full board, because of the nature of the work, mm -hmm. we always knew that there are a lot of mistakes that are being made, or there are problems, or there are restrictions, limitations to the law. I think when I actually started the job, it was a further realization that we needed more people involved in decision making despite how small the agency was. And that is something that I've worked really hard to address. Um, as far as the work itself, we, as you know, have been working really hard to address the backlog. That is something that the public really complains about. We've worked really hard to clean up Hearing Bureau. For example, there is a long queue of decisions that were held up and not you know, given to the applicants or licensees so they couldn't move forward with their business. We have a long queue in refunds, which we're starting to address. There is a need for, to change the tone better customer service, you know, delivering answers, maybe actually slowing it down and really think through before we deliver an answer that's a flat no. Mm. We're trying to come up with creative internally discuss, well, is it really a no or can we creatively try to figure out a way to say yes? So, so aside from those mindset changes, like when you just mentioned, for the ones that required reorganization, or uh, actually adding staff. How have you gone about doing that? I know you mentioned in your Senate finance uh, meeting back in June, the idea of the backlog committee coming together okay. in November. Can you talk about some of the reorganization or structural changes that have happened uh, on your watch? So we have been very fortunate. I mean, our 
chamber, this particular governor's office have been very supportive in trying to deliver better customer service for everybody involved in our area. And that change probably is the most important change that is allowing things to happen faster. So this year, um, as I mentioned before, there was already an, an, an effort to try to increase our staffing levels. What we've gotten this year within licensing, it's um, opportunities to pro promotions and upgrades and put more middle level management into licensing so we have better quality control, better deliverables, and our staff just being rewarded for the difficult, difficult work that they're doing. So we've gotten, a, we've gotten approvals from, thank God, for um, OGS, civil service, DOB, all coming together to support us in this endeavor. And so we are getting almost uh, 30 promotions um, in our licensing department, which is a really big deal. Um, and then uh, hopefully in the future, we'll have an opportunity to backfill those positions. That's a start. We've actually really changed the structure of our executive staff. It really used to be three people making all the decisions across eight bureaus um, with the general counsel, of course. Now we have a whole structure of three deputy commissioners, one chief of staff, general counsel, and a whole range of directors who all are given their own areas of responsibility and they, I allow them to sort of own their own relationships and bring in the work and deliver the services. Um, it's very much like running a Broadway show, actually. And after a quick break, we'll continue our conversation with Lily Fan, who has served as head of the State Liquor Authority since the summer of 2023. When we get back, we'll talk with Chair Fan about areas of improvement at the embattled agency under her watch, as well as implementing direct-to-consumer shipping of hard liquor. Capital Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse. For listeners just joining us, we're continuing our conversation with Lily Fan, an attorney and Tony Award-winning producer who took over as chair of the State Liquor Authority in 2023 and was confirmed for a full three-year term this spring. So you mentioned it's like running a Broadway show. What, what are the comps between running the State Liquor Authority and running a successful Broadway show? It's very much I have to trust the judgment of the different directors, right? Okay. You know, everybody have their own area. Everybody have their own relationships. And I have to trust that they're putting in the work to do their work. You know, on Broadway show, it's different departments of design. You know, it's advertising. It's marketing. You know, like everybody's got – we are a team, and we come around the table, and we make decisions together. But ultimately, they have to go back to their own offices and do their job well and then come to the table and participate. So we've changed a lot of things, you know, a lot of policy things. You know, when we are preparing for budget, state of the state, you know, I hope these guys feel that we are a team. You know, we are really – every meeting, it may be more time-consuming, but – Every issue we're dealing with, big issues that are coming up, you know, outdoor dining, budget priorities for next year. We are a room full of 12 people every time. So with a Broadway show, you might quantify success as Tony nominations and awards or ticket sales or how long something runs for. Or how do you quantify success for the State Liquor Authority? Are there metrics that you would point to that say we're getting licensing done faster or we're hearing more bureau uh, hearings or the sale of alcohol is up. What do you do to actually, at the end of the day, determine whether you're doing a good job? When I started, I came because I knew the stakeholders had a lot of problems. Like the restaurants had a lot of you know challenges. Enforcement was out and people felt a certain way about our enforcement efforts. I think I started because of the industry. But now I'm in the job and I am staying because of the happiness of the staff because of the reward they feel about working at this agency and staying at this agency. I think that's something that we've improved a lot is the ability to retain our staff. As far as the industry being happy, you know, alcohol is very much an inside baseball game. Ultimately, 
we are managing one pie. We've gotten the tools legislatively to try to expand the pie. So I see that as a new effort that our administration is trying to make is really focus on the economic development aspect of it. That's a really good blessing between having the statutory change that happened and this governor's support in trying to expand the pie. But within that, you're really just redividing the pie and trying to make it more fair. But so something like licensing, yeah. how have timelines changed now that you've had additional staff or have been able to deploy a, a backlog uh, committee? Do you feel like the pace of licensing is accelerated and do you feel like you've addressed any uh, institutional things that might have contributed to delays? The backlog committee has addressed almost 2,000 applications by now since its deployment in November, which I think it's a big win. Wait times have decreased significantly. Used to be nine and a half month wait for an on-premise. Now it's six months. Used to be nine month wait for a grocery store license. Now it's about six months. We've done other smaller items, getting temporary permits out faster. It used to be 30 day renewals. Now it's 90 day renewals. Initial licenses used to be 90 days for temporary permits. And now there was just a bill passed to change it to 180 days. So initially when you get your temporary permit, you're getting it for six months. So all of that work together so that you probably only have to apply for the temporary permit once and you don't ever have to renew. That's helpful on both sides. It cut the licensees right. work and it cuts out staff work. Can you imagine we used to do three month issuing every 30 day renewal. Half of our staff was doing temporary permit renewals. And now it's not that. Now it's one license when the governor signs um, the bill, one permit, it's six months. So that's really huge. We've also changed our renewal process. Um, we've heard from other incidents that people are having a really hard time meeting the renewal deadline. A liquor license is a privilege. You do have to apply for a renewal and people always wait until the last minute. But we've now made it that you can actually, ju we used to be that we have to give you a physical form for you to submit for renewal. Now it's not like that. You can go online, you get the information, you find out how, what the fee you will owe, and then you can just submit your renewal that way. And so th those are little things that we're doing administratively that I think it's making it easier for people to run their business. You know, I'm obsessed with this one government concept that don't make it so difficult for people, you know. But there's limitations, though, to what you can do administratively given the state laws and over the last two decades we've had numerous blue ribbon panels commissions etc take a look at updating the state laws so as you've gotten your hands dirty and, and messed around with efforts to improve things administratively are you bumping up against laws i mean you said archaic laws early in our conversation that you think could be uh, amended, tossed out, overhauled completely that would make the administration of your job easier and the experience of both consumers and alcohol businesses better? There is a want for change everywhere. Okay. I think the stakeholders are talking to their legislative representatives. The legislative representatives call us and whenever there is a license-based question it ultimately points to a policy that needs to change. So I think we do have a lot of support around Albany to to make things easier for licensees. I don't... But, but are there changes to the laws that you're eyeing at this point? Yeah, there's certainly, you know... That you want to tell me about? Well, I can't really talk about, you know, policy changes, but I think just from the commission report, mm -hmm. we see there's energy for change. Yeah, a lot of support for a lot of different priorities that yeah. then were DOA in the legislature. Exactly. And out of those 28 recommendations, eight already got done. Five or six of them are like, oh, no change or, you know, sort of big picture administrative budgetary things that mm -hmm. the administration has to do. So that leaves us with 14, 15 priorities that was even discussed at that commission, right? But beyond that, there's there's a lot more. There's a lot more that our staff is coming up, and that's what I was talking about when we have these gotcha. roundtables. 
the staff is coming up with the ideas. You know, if you do this, like, you know, change the doors here, or it shouldn't all be inside, outside, you know, like little things mm. that will make a huge difference. And we certainly hear that from the public, and we try to deliver that in our bills, our program bills, budgetary suggestions, all of those things. Well, one of the potential changes that's on the table right now is uh, allowing direct-to-consumer shipping of hard liquor, essentially expanding the system in place for wine deliveries. If signed into law, the implementation would be left up to uh, your agency. Um, when you think about this type of system, I know a version of which was floated in legislation by the SLA. What are the rules and regulations that you think, generally speaking, need to be in place to make sure that it doesn't contribute to, say, underage drinking and is still a boon for producers that they can actually take advantage of it. Is there any sort of guidelines that make sense uh, to you as you think about making something like that successful? Honestly, the rules are already in place. Okay, because there of the wine rules? Exactly. The wine rules, grocery stores can deliver, mm -hmm. liquor stores can deliver, liquor stores can ship. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel? No. I think the third-party delivery companies already know about how to avoid sell to minor. You know, the FedExes of the world, UPS, they already have a system in place. And so they're just continuing that same work with additional shippers that will be now coming directly from the manufacturers. And one of the key points about alcohol is that we rely on self-compliance. The fact that these manufacturers are coming to Albany asking for a change to allow them to do something, I think it's good. They're not asking for a legislative change so that they can then break the law. Like that wouldn't make sense. Especially what's at stake for them, it's huge. It's their manufacturing license. This is not just a restaurant that you can close and go somewhere else and restart. You know, sometimes we see that when people violate the law, they try to close this grocery store, you know, and go open a different one. Like, those things are almost l l like smaller. If you lose your manufacturing license because you're shipping to minors, like that's very serious. I don't see these manufacturers as being that type of personality. I, I really don't see it. You know, we interact with them, we know they're law binding citizens. That's why they want to come for the legal approval of doing this. Well, finally, because government is, to a large degree, a zero-sum game, I'm curious whether the focus on the Office of Cannabis Management and its licensing process right now, with kind of having this all-hands-on-deck approach, has impacted your resources and your capacity to do work. Uh, no, we really have not been impacted. I mean, we are certainly very much in support of OCM figuring out how to do their work well mm -hmm. and serving their licensees well. But I would not say that there is really an impact on our resource. So you can still get like OGS Commissioner Jeanette Moy on the phone. She's not spending all her time over at OCM or anything. Well, she happens to be a really good friend of mine. so she <laughs> I, I kind of knew that, which is why I dropped that reference. <laughs> Um, so, no, I, I don't think that there's any limitation to our resource. I mean, we're there to help them. I mean, you know, crazy enough, we are ultimately 154 people doing almost 100,000 licenses a year. That's a volume that we take care of. We've always been able to do that with, with a very small number of people. It's much, much harder trying to start a new business and manage a whole new thing. So the stakes for them are much, much higher, and I don't think it's fair to compare. Well, there are a million other alcohol-related issues we could talk about, but unfortunately, we're out of time, so hopefully we'll have you back in the future. Uh, we've been speaking with the State Liquor Authority Chair, Lily Fan. Chair Fan, thank you so much for making the time, and thank good luck. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a statewide union of nearly 700,000 professionals in education and health care.